morning. Uh, my name is Andrea Mason, and I'm a faculty member in the kinesiology department. Uh, I teach one of the required undergraduate classes um, for all of the majors in kinesiology. And we've had some problems over the last, I would say, five or so years trying to get everyone into these required classes, mainly because a lot of our classes require labs. And we're a little bit limited in how many students we can have in each lab section. And so I decided that I would start teaching a class during the summer. Um, and um, the unfortunate thing was that during the summer, I would get six people who would sign up for the lab, and I would still have waiting lists of 25 and 30 people for the fall and spring. No one wanted to take it in the summer. And so I kind of realized that in order to get uh, the number of students that I needed in order to run the class in the summer and kind of ease some of the pressure that we were having in the fall and spring was to take my class and put it online. And so I actually applied for some of the money through um, UW Distance Education to uh, take my course and turn it into an online version of the course. And through that, um, was sort of exposed to a lot of the tools that people use for online teaching. Um, and so I determined that um, I was going to need to provide students in order to do an effective job of, of this online course. I was going to need to do a mix of different ways of presenting information to the students. So I did a lot of writing in my course, um, but I also wanted to do some narrated PowerPoints for some of the um, things that I felt they really need to hear, they needed to hear my voice and they needed to see moving visuals in order for me to be able to get the point across. Um, at one point, I, I was part of the blended learning program and at one point we did sort of a tour of a facility where they showed us a lot of different technologies and they showed us things like Captivate um, and they, they showed us Articulate Storyline and the person who was doing the demonstration of Articulate Storyline essentially said, oh, this one is the most powerful. Um, we don't have a license for it on campus, but it's the most powerful tool. So I was like, well, of course I want to have the most powerful tool, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the one that's the best. Um, and so I used um, some of my own teaching money in order to, to buy that piece of software and played around with it. When I was first getting started, because I actually taught myself how to use the program, when I was first getting started, um, I also used lynda.com. So for those of you who haven't had a chance to look at lynda.com, um, I actually watched several videos on there, and that really got me started. Um, and even before I bought the, the software, I watched several of the videos, and I was really impressed with all of the different things that you could do with the, with the software, and that actually led me to buy the software. So what I want to show you now is a little bit of a narrated PowerPoint that I created with all of its warts, um, and there are lots of them. Um, this was very new to me, and so um, I wasn't entirely sure what I was doing a lot of the time. Um, but hopefully this will give you an idea. Oh, there we go. It's, the sound is not on. Well, your computer volume looks like it's really low. Okay. They do this for a predetermined amount of time. Based on the results of his experiment, Fitz reasoned that movement times would increase as the movement difficulty increased, and that movement difficulty was related to two task variables. First is the amplitude of the movement, that is how far the participant has to move the stylus to get from the center of one target to the center of the other. The second variable is the width of the target, that is, how big of an area you have to hit to be successful. By combining these two variables, Fitz introduced the term index of difficulty. As indicated, ID is equal to log to the base two, two times the amplitude divided by the width. This should seem pretty familiar because it uses the same theoretical logic that Hicks used in the formulation of his equation for reaction time. So this is Fitz's original data. Notice that ID, or index of difficulty, is shown on the x-axis, and movement time is shown on the y-axis. 
The legend shows the different target widths that Fitz used in his experiment. Looking at the relationship between index of difficulty and movement time, we see that this is a linear relationship. Specifically, movement time increases by a constant amount every time we increase index of difficulty by one bit. So Fitz was able to mathematically model the relationship between index of difficulty and movement time as mt is equal to a plus b log to the base 2, 2 times a over w, where mt is your average movement time, a is the y-intercept, b is the slope, large a is the amplitude, so how far you have to move from the center of the left target to the center of the right target, and large w is the width I just want to get to one more thing. the target that you have to accurately hit. The really cool thing about this equation is that it allows us to predict a person's movement time based on the amplitude of the movement and the size of the target they are aiming to. So if I know your equation, I could predict how long it would take you to aim toward any target given its amplitude and width. So let's take a closer look at each of the elements of the equation, starting with the index of difficulty. We see for the example here that the ratio of amplitude to width is the same for the two sets of targets. This means that the index of difficulty will also be the same for these targets. What is that ID? Type it into the answer box. So this was what I wanted to get to. So this is an opportunity for a student to type in an answer based on what they know, and it'll give them feedback um, based on that. This is the only narrated PowerPoint that I did this in. <laughs> it, was, it was very difficult. It doesn't always work. If students try to go back and redo it, it messes up. Um, so I actually chose this technology because I thought this is really fun. I'll be able to do some in PowerPoint quizzing. Um, and it ended up being way more work than, than I expected. So um, that is an example of one of the narrated PowerPoints that I created for this summer course. I think I did between six and 10 of them for, for the whole course. Um, and each one took days. Um, and the days was all of those arrows that came flying in, um, that was all me trying to time those events with the narration that I had done. Um, I'm sure you noticed at the probably third slide, the volume changed mm -hmm. on the PowerPoint. I made a mistake and I went back and fixed it. And at first I was trucking, I'm actually on the, the west side of campus, and I was trucking over here to use a soundproof chamber or um, like an uh, audio recording booth uh, to do my recordings. And I decided, ah, I'm just gonna stay in my own building and do this. And I redid the, that slide, and of course the audio is very different. Mm -hmm. I was also really sick when I recorded a lot of those videos, and it shows up. I mean, my voice is very different than it normally is. So a couple of lessons learned in doing that. Don't, don't record when you're sick, and try to always stay in the same room so that the audio stays the same. Um, so one of the questions that I was asked to answer was, what did the students think of this? And so we have our normal student surveys at the end of, of um, the course, and Pretty much they said nothing about them in the end. Nobody said, oh, those were awesome. You know, I really liked your narrated PowerPoints. One student did comment that there should have been more narrated PowerPoints and less reading in the course. Another student said that I, did, I sounded bored when I was narrating them. Um, but beyond that, there was really very little reaction to them. Um, which was interesting, um, you know, particularly because that was the part of the course that I probably put the most work into and that I was the most excited about. Not saying that you shouldn't use the technology, um, but don't get your hopes up, I guess, is what I'm, <laughs> what I'm saying. Um, what would I do differently? I actually thought Articulate Storyline as a technology was, was pretty easy to use. Very, very time consuming but pretty easy to use. Once I watched those videos and kind of got the basics down, I was definitely able to do most of what I wanted to do in the software. So I actually, I, probably, I would recommend it if this is kind of something that you'd like to do for your course. I thought it was, I thought it was a pretty good technology. Um, I would definitely encourage um, 
thinking really, really hard before jumping into anything about where it's going to be most effective in your teaching, mainly because it's so time consuming. Um, you know, I can normally stand when I'm teaching face to face and point at things on the screen when I'm trying to get students to attend to that thing, and that's all stuff that you have to do, and each of those events takes a really long time. Yeah? I'm not clear, but did you do that using PowerPoint tools, or did you do that using our so it's, it's in Articulate. All of those things are done in Articulate, but these were based on my PowerPoint slides, so what I was able to do was import all of my PowerPoint slides into Articulate. They, they came in very nicely. They all looked just as I had designed them. But then all of those arrows and things coming in, that was done in Articulate oh. itself. Yeah, and so what I did was I pulled all the slides in, I narrated them all, and then I created the events after I had narrated, where it was like, oh, okay, I need, I need to draw their attention to this thing right here, and so I added those events after the narration. All right, well, I think that's probably my 10 minutes, right? So I, I've got a quick question. We're gonna jump in and give everybody a chance. Now, articulate storyline is a Windows-only device, or Windows-only tool, and They've come out with a new one called Articulate Rise, which you can get a free 30-day trial with. Um, and it's super easy, too. Like, I have never, how many of you have used Articulate before? All right. So, ooh, this is going to be a fun discussion then. Um, and how many of you have used Articulate Rise? 60 Rise. Oh, just the people who made the activity sheet. All right. So this will be uh, fun for you. And I think it will be interesting, interesting um, for you to see the difference between the two, so uh, uh, between the cloud-based one and the Windows-based one. Um, and I'd love to get your reaction and, uh, and some feedback on that. Not feedback that I have anything to do with any of either of them, but just to have some experience with it. Uh, one quick question, Andrea. How long did it take you to make the first one that you did, and how long did it take you to make the last one? And is there a, a shortening of, of the amount of time that it took? And if you know, 20 things from now would be like, I can do this without any problem at yeah. all. Yeah, uh, it definitely. There was a huge <laughs> decrease in the amount of time. I would say so. This was the first one I did. Um, and I would say, and I definitely was gung ho about all the things I was going to try in this one. Um, I would say that this one probably took me um, a week to make, um, you know, like a full-time week oh, spread over a semester because I was working on it while I was doing other things. But I would say it was probably a week to do it. And that was mainly in trying to figure out how to time the events, like how to, you know, move the arrow over here and, and you know, all of that kind of stuff. And I got a lot better at it. I would say by the end it was probably taking me two days instead of a week. And then one more quick follow-up um, before we get going. Conceptually, was the first one that you did, how, how, how did they change conceptually? Like, did you figure out that this thing wasn't going to work or was not worth the effort, and so they became more simple? Or did they, um, are there any, like, particular things that you thought were really cool that you're like, hmm, this is an all because that was more effective? Yeah. Well, I definitely know that this, this thing the entering, I, I totally abandoned that after the first one. And that was, uh, interestingly enough, the reason why I chose the tool over some of the other ones, because of this ability to actually do all of these, you know, little things inside. But I mean, you can have people click on certain areas of the screen and things will pop up. And, you know, I thought I was going to use all of those tools, uh, but I didn't end up. I, I realized that the amount of time that it was going to take me to do those things and the return that I was going to get on it just didn't match up. Um, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't worth it. I mean, in the end, nobody said, whoa, I really love the fact that I could try out this problem inside the narrated PowerPoint. If I had done it in the little block of text underneath the narrated PowerPoint, I'm sure people would have been just as happy or not happy, you know. <laughs> um, it, it didn't really affect anything, I don't think. Um, so you can have them in the D2L course. Exactly, and that's what I ended up doing. So any of the quizzing that I did, I ended up just incorporating into the learning management system. So. Great. Thank you. Sounds like it's a lot of ways to complexity of the software package. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
definitely a speed, a speed accuracy trade-off, but yeah.